good morning. And how are you? It's once again time for the House Whisperer Show on WWDB Talk 860. Stay tuned for expert advice. You came to the right place. Expert advice about maintaining your house from the roof to the basement and everything in between. Featuring professional home inspector Jack Milne. I'm Barry Reisman. And uh, Jack is a guy that tells us that every house has a story. And uh, Jack is going to continue with uh, what he started last week. Good morning, Jack. Well, good morning, Barry. Yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed last week's show. Um, it was dedicated to all you dads and fathers and grandfathers and soon-to-be fathers about wanting to build the ultimate men's toy box. And, again, I always liked that show uh, with Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Uh, and uh, he always seemed to have a good time in his garage. He was always working on something, usually blowing things up at the same time. Um, but we're going to leave each levels of expertise out there to each of you individuals. <laughs> so, so last week we, we, we did talk about how to build the detached garage from verifying the impervious surface ratios, obtaining your plot plan, seeking variances if needed, hiring an architect to draw the plans, obtaining your permits, and getting ready to start your project. And, again, Dad, this is your show for Father's Day, even though I'm a week later. Uh, so, again, my best to all of you. I'm a father of two boys myself. One's 23 and one's 15. And, you know, as I, as I look at the bags under my eyes, you know, uh, I see them as the badge of courage. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, Barry? Yeah. But I wouldn't have it any other way. So part two of our adventure today is from excavation to completion. So before we start, I'd like to thank my sponsors. Um, we'll go a little bit out of order today. Borough Exterminating, Rob Bruno out of Glen Oldham, Pennsylvania. Great staff, great inspectors. They will help you with your termite and radon testing. And uh, you can reach out to them at 610-586-5640. Buxmont Inspections out of Sellersville, Pennsylvania, but they do cover a large swath of area. You can reach them at 215-669-4213. Uh, their website is BuxmontInspections.com. BrainFlushGear.com. Again, uh, I, I, I love these guys. I, you know, I can give them ideas. They put them uh, into art, and I'm wearing one today. So. Um, you can reach out to them at contact at brainflushgear.com. Anything you want, they can make and you can wear it. Pest Blaster, uh, they will help you with radon, mold, wood destroying insect inspections, as well as pest removal. Um, they're out of Hamilton, New Jersey, but you can reach them at 215 295 5555, and their website is pestblaster.com. Again, Tri County Inspection Company. I've run Tri County since 1985. We have four excellent home inspectors. We cover 15 counties, so we're out there. And you know, and by the way, Barry, we're we're averaging right now between 40 to 50 properties a week. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. So the real estate market is uh, is crazy, but uh, but we always get our reports out the next business day. We do take pictures typically of those items that need particular uh, 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 attention to detail or that those things that clients just cannot see, like items from the roof or down the chimney. So anyway, uh, 215-295-2030. Is our, uh, is our main line in Bucks and Montgomery County, 610-346-7880. We'll reach our listeners up there in the Lehigh Valley. North Jersey, 609-882-5188 is North Jersey, and 856-853-4224 um, is our South Jersey line. So uh, visit the website, tcinspect.com, get to know us. We'll be happy to get to know you and, and tell you exactly what you bought. So, as I like to say, please thank my sponsors because without them, I wouldn't be chatting with you today. Previous episodes on the on the um, housewhispershow.com. We are up to the end of May, uh, so I'm trying to get these shows done at the end of each month. Uh, so, you know, please and also please keep sending me the emails uh, to the housewhispershow at gmail.com. And WWDB, I can't thank them enough for having the podcast available 24-7. And you can, you can re-listen re to the show at WWDBAM.com. 
So, um, again, the email box, I'm going to let go this week uh, so I can finish this episode on Let's Build a Garage Part 2 from excavation to finish. Uh, but, again, I do review all the emails that I get, and I do respond to some, and uh, I put others on the air. So we'll do that again soon. So, uh, so let's get started. So the surveyor is done. The corners are set. The posts are planted. Uh, so let's dig away. Now, footings in this area have to be at least three feet deep to hit what we call the frost, the frost line to keep any future building uh, movement uh, limited. The footings have to be two times as wide as the foundation wall. So the, the permit and the municipality will require how wide your, your uh, foundation is going to be. Is it going to be 8 inches wide? Is it going to be 16 inches wide? So however wide the block work is, then the footing has to be twice that width. So the, the, the permit process will require a, a review um, uh, once the footings are dug to see the depth, the width, and the concrete poured for the footing. Once the footing is established, uh, then the block work begins. So based on, on the corner marking set by the surveyor, what we call lines, which are essentially string lines are set, and the masons work off these string lines to make sure that the building goes up not only square, uh, but also plumb. Um, and again, we, we may not be using that many courses of block, maybe four or five, but it all comes down to the lay of the land. So, um, so if, if you have, if your building's at a level, it's, it's not good. Uh, but once the block work is set, then the foundation bowls, bolts are then put in. And that's what um, <clears throat> will actually mechanically fasten the, what we call the bottom plate, which is your first piece of lumber on the block work. Don't forget the foundation sill sealer. Um, and then we, we will mechanically fasten not only the plate, but the full wall to that foundation bolt. So when they build walls, they build them literally on the ground, and they're going to notch the bottom plate, again, to accept the foundation bolt. And whatever you're choosing to put in those, let's say, the side wall, be it a door, an entry door, be it a window, they have to make sure that on those end walls, they're going to put the headers above the doors and the headers above the windows. And then, you know, through some help, they're going to actually stand the wall up they're going to take additional two by fours and and lay them on a diagonal, attach them at the top in order to get the wall uh, as erect and 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 plumb as possible. Then they start the next wall. The next wall may be the back wall. You might not have anything in that back wall, so that one they can set up actually pretty fast. So again, we're going to have a bottom plate. We're going to have our two by four by eights or two by four by tens. Um, uh, depending on the elevation of the garage, all tacked together, uh, two top plates at the top, one at the bottom. And what they do, folks, is they're going to notch one side of the wall that they just put up, but extend uh, the rear wall so that it lays over the top of the wall that they, they just put up earlier. This is how they tie in your corners. And then they work right around to the, the other side, and then the primary what I call the primary side. The primary side is where your garage door is going to go. Now, due to your impervious surface ratio and your square footage, um, let's say we're fortunate enough to do a, a two-car garage. You have options in this phase. Do you want to do two single-car garages, or do you want to do one 16-foot garage door? When I did mine, I did a single 16-foot garage door because in this way, I didn't have to worry about any type of uh, partition. Um, and it allows me to swing into my garage door where I don't have this 12-inch section between one door and the other. The other thing I did on my plan was to lay out my, what we call the ceiling joist. The ceiling joist is what you look up at, and that's what helped rack your building. Now, the one thing I did not want in my garage was any type of a support uh, beam or post. Because, folks, if you live in a house now, 
that has a, a support column in the garage, you know what? No matter where you park, your door is going to hit the post. So my garage is 24 wide by 30 deep. So what I did is I increased the size of my joist to 2 by 10s. Most garages are typically 2 by 6s. But this way I could go clear span, and then above my joist I installed something called a strong back. Uh, a strong back is a vertical piece of 2 by 8 that's supported to a horizontal member of two by eight. So it looks, guys, like an L. And then the bottom plate, which is laying horizontally, is then tacked to the joist and extends from one gable end to the other. So I have this area of my garage that's 24 wide, 22 foot deep, that supports you know my two vehicles, a couple motorcycles. At the end of the 22 foot wall, guys, I put in a full wall. So the last eight feet is dedicated to a workshop. So I put in two single doors between my garage and my workshop, one on the far left side, one on the far right side. And the reason for this is that if I'm working in the shop uh, during the winter months, I can literally close the shop off uh, from the garage uh, and throw on some, a little bit of electric baseboard heat, and I am a comfy boy. The other thing I did is I put in a smaller overhead garage door on my on one side. So this way I can pull in my the tractor or lawn equipment or anything that I need to that's larger than the entry doors of which I put in. So uh, again, this is my toy box and so I, again I put a lot of thought into it uh before, you know, I started digging. So uh, I want you, to, you want you to do the same thing. So once all four walls are up, then we have to in, construct, of course, the roof line. The roof line is going to be made up of your rafters, your ridge rafter, and your sheathing. Once the roof rafter has been, the ridge rafter has been established, then they're going to cut your rafters accordingly, um, so that. Um, they, they notch the, the what we they call it a bird's mouth, guys, believe it or not, over your two top plates. And by the time that the skeleton is constructed, you know, you're seeing for the first time what your future garage is going to look like. And it gets pretty exciting. Hey, Jack, could we take a quick break? I'm, I'm excited already, uh, and I can't wait to hear the second part. Well... When we get back, Barry, we're going to talk about putting the skin on the bones. I can hardly wait. Jack Milne, the House Whisperer, is here, and we'll be right back after this. Oro Exterminating has been specializing in wood-destroying insect inspection and control for over 40 years, serving Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. All inspectors are state certified and ensure providing their clients with professional inspections and treatments. Oro not only performs conventional termite treatments, but also handles special services like historic buildings and homes with wells, creeks, or ponds. The client is assured that all treatments will be performed safely when you hire Boro to do the work. They also provide radon testing in their service area. Boro's full-time office staff is available to help you schedule an appointment. Just call 610-586-5640 or send an email request to boroinspects at verizon.net. That's 610-586-5640 or email at boroughinspects at verizon.net. Specially created t-shirts by BrainPlushGear.com offer the extreme sports enthusiast an opportunity to have a clothing line available that suits their sport. BrainPlushGear.com understands that when we get the moment where we can jump on our motorcycles, wave runners, surfboards, snowmobiles, or skateboards, it can be priceless. They offer custom artwork including silk screening, transfers, and embroidery. Speak to one of their consultants today and they'll help you create your own brain flush visit brainflushgear.com or email them at contact at brainflushgear.com 
For your septic inspection and testing needs, please consider Buxmont Inspections. They've been serving the Bucks and Montgomery County areas for over 15 years. As members of the Pennsylvania Septage Management Association, the Pennsylvania Association of Sewage Enforcement Officers, and the Pennsylvania Association for Professional Soil Scientists, Buxmont Inspections can inspect your existing septic system or test for your new septic system placement. Please call Rob Bowie at 215-669-4213 and say you heard their ad on the House Whisperer Show. Tri County Inspection Company has been providing professional home inspections, commercial inspections, and historic property evaluations for over 30 years. For all of your real estate transactions, call Tri County Inspections at 215 295 2030. For their New Jersey clientele, call 856 853 4224. Tri County Inspection Company covers 13 counties serving both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They have performed inspections for over 70,000 clients and are members of the American Society of Home Inspectors as well as the Pennsylvania Home Inspectors Coalition. They are licensed in both Philadelphia and New Jersey. Call 215 295 2030 or 856 853 4224. As the temperatures gradually rise, so do the odds of all those filthy and unwanted critters invading your home like rodents, roaches, termites, and flies. Oh, my. This summer, if you want to feel safe and secure from a possible creeping, crawling disaster, do yourself a favor and call the exterminating experts at Pest Blaster for all your pest control needs, including tests for radon and mold. Please visit PestBlaster.com and you'll be sold. 215-295-5555. Okay, we are back with Jack, and uh, we're in the process of uh, building our garage. And Jack, let's pick up where we left off. Okay, Barry. Well, you know, we, we, we talked about get, getting the framing completed from literally the ridge rafter um, down to your rafters. We have our ceiling joist set, which sit on top of your top plates. And, you know, a good framer is going to nail those rafters to the joist, so this building's not going anywhere. But... Um, what really puts this whole structure together, and I call it the skin on the bones. Now, that's your plywood or your exterior cladding. There's a choice, guys, okay? And, and I don't mean to leave the girls out at all during, during this explanation and this segment, but there's two types of sheathing. We have uh, standard plywood, which is half inch thick, don't use anything less. Uh, and then we have another material called uh, oriented strand board in our vernacular OSB. Oriented strand board is basically made of particles and, and chips of wood that's held together by glue, uh, and the glue is not water soluble. So if by any time this building gets wet, and or you have a, a concentrated leak that you weren't even aware of, the oriented strand board, folks, turns into I call it mulch. So it could be vertical mulch, it could be diagonal mulch, but at the end of the day, please specify for your, for your shelter uh, in this garage that you, you, that you specify plywood. Uh, if you're going to spend a dollar more per sheet and, and it, it runs another 30 bucks or 50 bucks, guys, it's well worth it. So once we literally tie the, the plywood to your rafters and to your exterior stud work and gable walls, uh, this building is at this point almost watertight. Now you have to think about how you want to finish it. You know, today vinyl siding is popular. Uh, hardy plank um, is a cement board siding. It's kind of pricey. But I think at the end of the day, you want to try to, to make your garage blend uh, with your home. So if you have aluminum siding on your house, uh, it, unfortunately, it may be a little bit more difficult to find aluminum siding, so you may want to think about maybe, you know, five, six, seven years from now, if I really had to take off the siding on my house, what would I want to do? You can practice on your garage. One thing I like about vinyl siding is they make it with a multitude of different size panels. You can do a twin four. You can do what we call a beaded eight. 
You can go with a five-inch panel. You can have materials that look like rough sawn cedar or machine cut cedar. You can you can pick and choose colors. You can make it look Victorian. You can make it look contemporary. So I think the vinyl sidings of today have come a long, long way from the siding that uh, when vinyl first uh, appeared in the 1980s. Me being as anal retentive as I am, uh, back in 1994, uh, I did put a vinyl coated uh, aluminum siding on my house that looks like cedar. Really turned out pretty. At that time, it was about 100 bucks a square. Today, in today's dollars, it's 400 dollars a square. So fortunately, I built my garage in 1994 uh, or five, and and I did my siding for the house right around the same time. So one blends in with the other, and I think it really does accent the property well. Shingles should be, of course, try to match that of your main home too, and it's the same scenario. Uh, you want to go with an architectural shingle. The three-tab shingles that may be on your house now have a life expectancy of 20 years. If you know you've been in that house and you know for 15 years or 30 years, you know that uh, the, with a 20-year shingle, within the next couple of years, you'll be swapping them out. So let the garage establish what you're, you want your property to look like in the future. And keep in mind, folks, even though it's a detached building, treat it like a house. You want to add your gutters. You want to do your capping, you know, so you don't have to paint anything. Um, go with a good insulated garage door. They make a lot of flimsy doors out there, but a good insulated, in my case, 16-foot door installed was about $900 back then. And you know what, guys? I put a garage door opener on it, too, so I've got the benefit of hitting a button and, and cruising in. Um, think about electrical power. Uh, any electrical power that runs from the house to the garage has to be down a minimum of 18 inches. You can go overhead, but it has to be off grade by 15 feet. A good electrician uh, can, can use something called a ditch switch and, and get this line out to your garage, make the penetration through the block work, and, and run a sub panel. Again, uh, me being a home inspector, uh, I ran 60 amps out to my garage. That allows me to provide baseboard heat for my garage independent of my workshop. That allows me to run all my power tools, my air compressor. I can do anything I want except sleep there. <laughs> but sometimes I feel like I can do that too. Uh, again, some municipalities may not want you to encourage, to encourage water supplies if you can, I would urge you do it because if you want to pull your car out to wash it, you're going to need 100 feet of hose to reach from your house uh, to the garage. So if you have that opportunity, do it. Uh, that water line has to be down 36 inches uh, from the grade so it prevents freezing. The other thing I did is when I ran my trenches, I ran uh, what we call conduit from my basement to my garage. I put a fishing line in it so I can pull things from my house to the garage. So, you know, like I've, I've been saying throughout the show, guys, I put a lot of thought into this structure. You know, the, the best part about it is that it offers all the flexibility that I need. If you have a water line, uh, you can think about a sink. Now, the sink is not is designed for hand washing. It's not designed to wash, you know, oil pans out and antifreezes and everything else because uh, you, you can allow the line to go out to grade, but it can only be for hand washing only. And through the you know, 15 years that I've had my garage now, my, my water lines have frozen twice. So I had to open up my ceilings twice. I had to make repairs twice. So I'm very diligent about turning my detached garage off, water, water supply off, uh, when I see my temperatures drop below 30 degrees outside. These are all things that I'm trying to plant seeds for you to consider. When it was done, and I, I, I hung a lot of plywood uh, on my walls. Why? Because then I could hang my 2x4s horizontally, bang more nails into that 2x4, to hang my rakes, uh, you know, my shovels, all my heavy, you know, garden equipment that I did not have to put into my primary garage so I wouldn't 
there's no potential of damaging my um, my vehicles or any other of my you know family's possessions. And you know what? There's nothing better than making it your own. So you can put the beer signs and you know you can put those things that you've collected over the years on your walls and where the wife may not want them in your house because again the garage is yours to enjoy. I know when my wife comes out to, to see me in the garage, she's almost like a little bit nervous because she knows she's not in her space uh, <laughs> and she's in mine. But everybody is also always welcome, and, uh, again, it's a nice place to enjoy. But, but make it waterproof. Uh, use vinyl windows if you want to put in windows. Uh, if you have uh, high-cost possessions, through that uh, line that you can run from your house to your, your garage, you can run a link to your security system. So think of it like a small house. You want to protect your assets, you know, that, like you would in your main home. So um, th think about it, work it, you know, be there when they need you to be there. Figure out your um, your budget accordingly. Uh, you may have to do some landscaping when it's all done. Uh, if you're going to do a gravel driveway, but you're planning on asphalting it, I would wait. I would recommend you wait six months before you put your asphalt down, so it allows you with your vehicles to run and settle that aggregate as much as you can, so that uh, when the asphalt is laid, uh, you don't get the depressions later. So. And that also helps with your budget, too. So, guys, if you have any questions. I do. Uh, can you give me some ballpark idea of the cost of building a two-car garage? Yes, Barry. And I'm going to use my numbers. It cost me $18,000 to do my 24 by 30 garage back in 1994. And like I mentioned, the, the largest cost was getting it out of the ground. Mm. Um, because concrete, especially today, guys, is expensive. So, you know, in today's dollars, Barry, for my size garage, I'll probably be about twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand. Uh, another question: Is it worth it? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, and and one more thing, guys, before you, because you pulled the permit, of course, you're going to get your property reassessed. When my property was reassessed, that garage or my, my tax bill went up an additional three hundred dollars. You know, it's it's also nice, guys. Even if it's a one car garage or a one and a half car garage, you know, it takes a lot of the burden off your main home, and then you can always use the area above the garage for storage purposes. Enjoy it. I know it's um, a lot of thought, but you have to put it down on paper. And as it is Sunday. Please spend time with friends and family, and we'll see you next week on the House Whisperer Show, where we're going to talk on the topic, Is My Basement Wet? Uh, good question. I'll see you in the garage. Uh, hey, listen, tune in again next week, everybody, for another edition of the House Whisperer Show with professional home inspector Jack Milne. And to listen to previous programs, or if you have any questions, visit thehousewhisperershow.com. Hi, Barry Reisman. Thanks for listening to WWDB.